بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله it's an honor for me to be here tonight I ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to make the time that we spend together beneficial that whatever we learn we learn only for his sake that Allah سبحانه وتعالى makes us of those that will act upon what they know the topic that we want to cover tonight is an important topic I suppose that every person before the month of Ramadan, depending on your culture, I'm going to make a guess and say that regardless of where you come from in the world, Ramadan is very important. Uh, for those of us that have grown up, you know, fasting, we were five, six, seven years old when we started, you know, this is an exciting time and we look forward to the month of Ramadan. But there's something that nags at uh, the back of our minds at the end of every Ramadan and that is that feeling that we haven't made the most of it. That feeling that I could have done better, I should have done better, would have, could have. The Prophet wasallam said, do not say if or should have or could have because that opens up the door for shaitan. The Muslim is never negative, he's not a pessimist or she's not a pessimist but rather we are positive and we are optimist. Uh, you know, optimistic about the future, optimistic about the present, and we don't dwell on issues. So this Ramadan, inshaAllah ta'ala, we want to take stock of the last Ramadan. And so this is what I will begin with. The first thing that I want us to do tonight is to take stock of the last Ramadan. To talk about the good points, to think about them. What did I do last Ramadan that was truly productive, that was truly beneficial? What is it that I did that I don't regret? that I'm happy that I was doing. What was it about last Ramadan in terms of my relationship with the Quran? Was I attending Taraweeh every night? Did I find myself very generous last Ramadan? Did I maximize my time? If not, then let's move on to the second part of this, this question or equation. And that is, what was I doing last Ramadan that I should not have been doing? What was it about last Ramadan where I fell short? What were my shortcomings in the last Ramadan? So this is where we need to be before we start. We are only a few days away, four or five days. And now we have to take stock of the last year. What have I been doing? Think about this for a moment. The Prophet wasallam said, وَرَمَضَانُ إِلَىٰ رَمَضَانُ كَفَارَةٌ لِمَا بَيْنَهُمَا That one Ramadan to the next is an expiation for whatever happened in between. So since last Ramadan, raise your hands if you have not sinned or disobeyed Allah. Raise your hands if you have not fallen short in what Allah has made compulsory upon you. And let's start with Salah. How many of you have, mashaAllah, been praying five times a day regularly since the last Ramadan? How many of us have been fasting regularly on Mondays and Thursdays? How many of us, you can see where this list is going. So in the last 12 months or 11 months, we have numerous shortcomings. It doesn't matter whether you wear a jubba, you've grown your beard, you wear an abaya, none of that matters. We all sin, regardless of who we are and where we come from, whether we've studied Islam or we haven't studied Islam. We all have our shortcomings, we all have our sins. The last you know, 12 months have, you know, have, have, have proven that to be true. So now is an opportunity for us, before we start this month of Ramadan, to look at it as an opportunity to wipe away everything that has happened in the last 12 months as if it never happened. But here's something important that we need to think about as well. That even though this month that's coming is a month in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has increased the barakah and the blessings of doing good deeds so that when you do good deeds in the month of Ramadan, they are not like the deeds that you do outside of Ramadan. At the same time, we need to remind ourselves that that applies to sins as well. That what we do in the month of Ramadan that is, you know, uh, disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not like the rest of the year. So, for instance, if you went for Hajj or for Umrah and you found yourself in the Masjid al Haram or Masjid al Nabawi, how would you find yourself there? People are even scared, you know, they, they bump into someone and they apologize profusely. I'm so sorry, you know, because they don't even want to hurt another Muslim or hurt a creature or, you know, cut down a tree because it's so sacred, so holy. Well, the month of Ramadan is like that. And so before we enter this month, let us start to think about the sacredness of this month. That no, we are supposed to be people that fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that possess taqwa, that are conscious and aware of Allah at 
you know, all the time. But the month of Ramadan is more deserving of that consciousness. That's why we find, subhanAllah, doesn't matter where you go in the world, you go to a masjid on the first night or the night before the first day of Ramadan, what do you find? It's packed. You can't, even, you can't even fit an ant into that masjid, am I right? People are praying outside of the masjid. Why? Why all of a sudden? Where did this come from? You know, when I was growing up, and you know, yesterday, I was teaching a course in, uh, uh, in Kota Damansara, and it was a Janazah course. And I was talking to them about, you know, thinking about death. And I was telling them that when I was younger, we were coming back from the club, and we were heading home, and the driver was speeding. And, you know, we drove into another car at 180 kilometers. And the person that was in the passenger seat, you know, was paralyzed. I broke my collarbone, had a massive gash in my head. I was about 16 or 17 at the time. And I thought, I didn't become automatically, you know, a practicing Muslim after this incident. But I did ask myself this question, what if I had died in this accident? You know, what if I died? I, it wasn't a religious question. I wasn't thinking, what would my relationship be with Allah if I had died in that state? You know, half intoxicated, coming back from the club, didn't pray a single prayer that day, or anything of the sort. So I asked myself this question. So many people in the audience are people that were coming back to Islam. Many of them were in their 20s and 30s and older. They had not been practicing Islam since they were young. And now they were coming back and they came to attend this course. They wanted to know more about, you know, the thick rulings about Salatul Janazah. And many of them had questions. And it was important for me to connect with them, you know, regarding this very important question. Because if the month of Ramadan is coming up, and we're going to take full advantage of it, then these are the kinds of questions that we need to that we need to be asking ourselves. Oh, what if we met Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala today? What if tonight Malakul Maut was to come and take our souls, the angel of death? If we met Allah now before the month of Ramadan, would we be able to feel content that Alhamdulillah, I feel secure and safe regarding my future in the year after? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. Because we're so focused on, on now and our lives as we live them now that we don't think about that often enough. So before the month of Ramadan comes, we really need to think about it. So the first of the three main points I want to make in this lecture is the following. The month of Ramadan is an amazing month. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنَ That the month of Ramadan is the month in which the Quran has been revealed. And I want to spend with you and I want to share with you what is it about the Quran that makes it so amazing? What is it about the Quran that really, you know, makes it so special so that when we end off on the virtues of the Quran tonight, you can walk away out of this lecture theater and you're going to be focusing on these four things that I'm going to mention inshallah for the whole month as you read the Quran. The first of them, and it's not really accessible for us until we begin to learn the language, is that the language of the Qur'an is miraculous. The language of the Qur'an is a language that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenged the people of Makkah and Arabia. Their language, this language that they were so proud of, that they competed with one another in. We don't have really competitions like that, do we? Poetry competitions where people come and they try to outdo one another in English or in Bahasa Malayu or any of the languages that I know you speak. Do you have this in your country? Where poets come around from around your country, they gather in the capital and they try to outdo one another in poetry. It's not very common, most, most of our cultures don't have that. But the Arabs have that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenges people to bring something like it, which they couldn't do. The second thing that the Quran points to when it talks about its miraculous nature is the fact that it gives us information about the past that we would not have had access to. How many of you have met Fir'aun and Qarun and Haman and Musa and Harun and Ibrahim and Nuh? We don't know anything about them. We would not have known anything about them if Allah had not told us about them. The second part of this information that Allah gives us is that He tells us about matters of the unseen. Things that we would not have known about. He tells us about himself. None of us here have seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. None of us here have met him. We have not seen Allah. We have not seen Jannah and Jahannam, paradise and hell. We have not seen the angels. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that in great detail in the Quran. Number three, Allah tells us about future events. 
things that have not yet happened. And perhaps the best example is the fact that the Prophet wasallam would be victorious at the Battle of Badr, and so it was. Or the fact that the Romans would defeat the Persians. Allah tells us who, He tells us when, and He tells us where. All of this in the Quran at the beginning of Surah Al-Rum. So we have information about the future that has become a reality. Is this not miraculous? Then lastly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about those issues that we would not have known about if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had not told us about them. The, what, what, what am I talking about? The thoughts and the emotions of the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran to. The, the believers. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reads these ayat to the Sahaba during the battle of Khandaq. Allah, Allah speaks about their fear. وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرِ They were so fearful during that battle, the Muslims, that their hearts were in their throats. How would we know what they were feeling if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had not told us? But Allah also speaks about the emotions and the thoughts and the secret meetings of the hypocrites in Medina. We would not have known about this if Allah had not exposed them to us. And also, Allah talks about Fir'aun, the Pharaoh. When Musa came to him and threw down his stick and it became a snake, Allah says they saw these signs. But, and they believed it in their hearts. They had absolute certainty because I'll, let me, be, let me ask you this question. If I took this stand right now and I threw it on the floor and it became a slithering snake and I then told you that I was a prophet of Allah, would you at least give it some consideration? You think about it, right? If I made that claim, I'm not saying because the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was the last prophet. But if something like that happened, you'd be like, oh, well, well that's, you know, I, I need to, that's something strange. And for Fir'aun, when he saw that and many other signs, they believed in their hearts, but with their tongues, they rejected the message. So this is number two, information in the Qur'an. Number three is this amazing legal, moral, and ethical code that we find in the Qur'an. Something that we need to think about. And I encourage you throughout the month, now starting tonight and throughout the month and even after the month, more importantly, I want you to think about these points that I've made tonight about the Quran. Because today when I teach my students about, when I teach them Islamic studies at the, the, the school where I teach, I don't go into, I don't talk about you know, praying five times a day. I don't talk to them about fasting the month of Ramadan or performing Hajj. Why? Because we as Muslims today, we don't recognize that the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't view it as being miraculous or divine. We just view it as a book that we take off the shelves in the month of Ramadan. Something that if it falls on the ground, we pick it up and we, we kiss it and we touch it to our foreheads. It's a book that, you know, you're supposed to respect. Take wudu before you touch it. It means it's, it's, it, has, it, has, it has lost its significance in the hearts of the Muslims. And so this is why I want to talk to you about this today. So that when you open up this book, you pay attention to the language. You pay attention to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is informing you of. And then number three, you pay attention to the laws, the morals and the, ethic, and, and the ethics of this. Let me, I'm going to give you one example of, of many. In Surah Al-Hujurat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibits us from backbiting. Think about a community where spying, suspicion, excessive suspicion and backbiting was eradicated. Think about your campus. Think about all the scandals and the backbiting and the, you know, people carrying tales between one another. All the false accusations that happen between students, that happen between people that are colleagues at work, that happen in communities and local masjids. Think about a society where this was eradicated, where you could leave this, you know, leave this lecture theater and no one would backbite you. Oh, did you see that brother? I can't believe he attended the lecture. Did you see that sister? Subhanallah, who would have thought all of that's backbiting? But you and I, because we have taken this, you know, this, this amazing ruling from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we leave. And we have nothing bad to say about our brothers and sisters. We are not overly suspicious of what they do and their intentions and their actions. And we definitely do not spy on them in any way, shape or form or mock them or call them offensive names. All of this mentioned in only one surah. And I'm only mentioning one aspect. Think about a community where this isn't the case. Look at what we have on the internet right now. All these websites, all these YouTube channels, all they deal with is gossip. Isn't it so? 
And look at how it destroys relationships and how it destroys people and what they think of others. One Sheikh, MashaAllah, he's amazing, everyone loves him. And then the next day, there's, a, there's an article about him. He did this or he did that. And many times it's just a rumor. And you're in time. I have seen people leave Islam because a sheikh of theirs was accused of you know, stealing funds or having an inappropriate relationship. And then after investigation, it's not true. Many they, you know, their the opponents or their enemies wanted to tarnish their name. And if we had what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in this surah, of not being overly suspicious, giving people the benefit of the doubt, of verifying information when it comes to us, then we would be so much better for it. So this is, these, this, these are some of the laws. And lastly, number four, I want you to pay attention as students, as people that are at university right now with access to amazing journals and amazing you know, re references. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran draws our attention to His signs. He draws our attention to the sun and the moon and the universe in general, the planets and the stars. He draws our attention to the embryo and its development in the womb of the mother. He draws our attention to the fact that everything that is living has been created from water. He draws our attention to the fact that the mountains have been placed as pegs to stabilize the earth. He draws our attention to the seas and the oceans. He draws our attention, does he not say, أَفَلَا يَنظُرُونَ إِلَى الْإِبِلِ كَيْفَ خُلِقَتْ do they not look at the camel and how it's being created? Have you ever spent time thinking about a camel? I mean, the only time I thought about a camel is when I was eating it. But uh, have you paid attention to a camel and how it's being created perfectly for its environment? For those of you that are studying biology and other related sciences, it is for you to pay attention to what Allah is, is calling you to ponder and think about it. Subhanallah. You know, I'm reading a book at the moment called Basic Economics. It's a book written by an American professor. And I've never thought about these concepts from an Islamic perspective. Supply and demand, price, the markets, fluctuation, all of these type of things. And now I'm thinking about what does Islam really have to say about capitalism or socialism, communism? What does Islam have to say about the free market? And you and I, we have this amazing source of knowledge that the month of Ramadan, it was revealed in this month. So let us turn to it and let us ask these questions about our lives, about what I'm feeling. You know, some of you might be saying at this moment, I miss home, I'm feeling depressed, I'm feeling overwhelmed, I'm suffering from anxiety. What does the Quran and Sunnah have to say about these things? I'm going through financial difficulty. What does Allah and His Messenger have to say about these things? I'm having a relationship problem. What does Allah and His Messenger have to say about these things? So the Quran, if it's the source of amazing knowledge, then you and I in the month of Ramadan and before it and after it, we need to turn back to it so that we can solve our problems and get answers that we desperately need need. So this is the first thing that I want to remind you of. The second thing is the month of Ramadan is a month in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened up the doors of Jannah and he's closed the doors of Jahannam and the shayateen have been chained and the deeds that you do in this month they are multiplied. So if you know that, if you know that, would you not now start this month and its preparation with Hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's reward. Would you not be more motivated to make the most of this month if you knew that? And I can go on and on talking to you about the virtues of the month of Ramadan, but I'll share that in a later point inshallah. Not to share the details, but to encourage you to learn as much about Ramadan and fasting as you possibly can. Now that we've, in, we've introduced the topic, let us move now to our second question. And that is, how can we make sure that Ramadan is more, this Ramadan is more productive? The first thing that we want to mention is that we have to mentally prepare ourselves. Many of the things I mentioned will be helpful to achieve that. How do we prepare ourselves for this month? If you know that this is a special month, if you know about all these ayat, all these verses in the Quran and all of these ahadith that motivate us to fast the month of Ramadan, if we know the rewards of fasting the month of Ramadan, if we know that being in the company of the believers is going to further encourage us, then Half of, the, half of the effort has already been made. We have all of this information, but we have to sit down and really prepare. Which brings me to the second point. The second point that we need to do is to make dua. Is to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now before the month starts. Ya Allah, 
The month of Ramadan is upon us. Ya Allah, make this Ramadan better than every other Ramadan that has preceded it. Ya Allah, I'm weak and I make mistakes and I, and I sin daily. But oh Allah, only you have the ability to change my heart, to make me better so that I may be the best Muslim that I can be in this month and every other month after it until I meet you, Ya Allah. So what, did, what in preparation, what can you do? You can turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because only He has the power and the ability to make you successful and productive in this month. Many times we rely upon ourselves, isn't it so? You know, when you study and you get excellent results, and you are being headhunted by companies, inshallah. I make dua that this is going to happen for all of you. You get headhunted, and then you achieve this amazing position at this new company or the startup or something similar, and you rise up the ranks and you become a senior executive or something higher than that. And you feel after 20 years, mashallah, look at what I have achieved. It's so amazing. You go online, you check your bank account, and you feel good. And you look at your home and you feel it's amazing. You think about your holiday house in Cape Town. And I mentioned Cape Town because of course it's the most beautiful city in the world. But you have your holiday home, your vacation home in Cape Town. You know, it's on the ocean there, mashallah, with an amazing view. You think about all of that. And one of the things we fall victim to is that we think all of that is because of us. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had nothing to do with that. That is because when I was in Malaysia at Taylor, Taylor's University, I put in the hours, I worked hard, I made the sacrifice. I didn't go out, I didn't party, I didn't, I didn't you know, waste any time. I got that degree, I got that you know, postgraduate degree, I did the work, and now all of this is me. All of this is me, but in reality, is it? When someone passes away, what do we say? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We belong to Allah and to Him we will we will return. When we, when we give words of condolences to someone who's lost a loved one, what do we say? Lillahi ma akhada, wa lillahi ma a'ta. To Allah belongs what He has taken, and to Him belongs what He has given. Everything that we have, whether it be a lot or a little, is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you make dua, think about that. Think about the fact that your knowledge, your intelligence, everything that you have is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your dua will be more sincere. It will be more heartfelt. It will come from the deepest recesses of your soul. It won't just be th something that you say with your tongue. So dua is the second thing. Number three, we need to clear our schedules as much as possible. I know that's difficult for you. The university exactly doesn't shut down just because we are having the month of Ramadan, does it? Oh, mashallah, let me see how many Muslims. Okay, uh, you know, students, we are going to uh, uh, end all classes. Uh, classes will be suspended for the next, uh, for May and for June. Uh, we'll come back after Eid. That doesn't happen, right? And if you're working, it doesn't happen either. Unless, of course, you know, you, like myself, I used to be a student in Saudi Arabia, and being a student in Saudi Arabia was awesome in the month of Ramadan, because classes would start at like 10 and end like at 12.30, instead of being like from 7.30 until 1.30, right? Uh, I'm not gonna say that in Saudi Arabia, the people are lazy. I'm just gonna say that it was amazing. And many companies would, many companies would close, you know, early, et cetera, et cetera, but many countries don't have that. Like if you're living in South Africa or you're living, you know, in the West, um, no one really takes, you know, uh, cares about that. Like for, for us in Cape Town, we have to fight to be, to be able to go for Jumu'ah every Friday. I mean, we have to threaten our employers, you know, with legal action if they don't allow us to go for Jumu'ah. It's like our legal right. Yeah, in Malaysia, Eid is a public holiday. In South Africa, your boss is like, no, you need to be at work tomorrow. We have a, we have a, a meeting, we, we have a project deadline. You're like, no, but it's Eid. Yeah, so it's a religious holiday, not a public one. You know? So what I'm saying is that I understand as a father and as a husband, we all have, and as someone who's employed, we have responsibilities, but what we should try to do is all the unnecessary commitments that we have, all the things that distract us, that are not necessary, all the appointments that you, know, you could possibly delay until after Ramadan, do so. Clear your schedule as much as possible so that all of your free time can be dedicated to being as productive in this month as you possibly can. 
Wallahi, I wish that I could say to all of the people that, you know, I work for or work with, I'm like, you know, uh, sorry, I, I think I'm going to take a break this month, inshallah. Right? I'll see you all in, uh, after Ramadan, you know, after like a week. I was even telling uh, the principal of the school today, I said, subhanallah, I wish that I could take the next month and a half off and come back fresh in July. And he looked at me and he was like, no, that's not going to happen. Right? So I'm going to have to go to class every day and teach Quran from 8 to 9, 20, etc, etc. I'm not going to get a break. But there are so many other things that in the month of Ramadan, we can lessen. And we can make sure that, you know, they don't distract us from making the most of this month. Number four, and that is organizing your time with the schedule. You do that now as students. You do that now, you know, whether you're a student or not. You have your schedule for the day. These are my classes. You have tutorials. You have other things that you need to get done. But what have you written in your calendars for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What have you written in your calendars for after Fajr in the morning? What have you written regarding when you will help out feeding the poor and the refugees and those people that are in need? How much time have you set out to make sure that you are holding and keeping good family ties? The month of Ramadan, I don't know about you, but when I was a student, obviously we did not have, and now I, I'm not sure I should, I should mention this because you know, now you'll know how old I am. But when I was a student at university, we did not have mobile phones, okay? The first phone that I saw people using was a Nokia 3310. You know, those bricks. Uh, you, could, uh, you could actually harm someone with, with one of those things, right? They were massive. But the point is that I could only speak to my parents once a month. We'd get our stipend from the university. We'd go to, you know, for those of you that come from the Gulf in the Saudi Arabia specifically, they used to have this, like we call them cabinas. And you go in, you pick up the phone and you dial the number and then you speak for how long. And then afterwards you go and you pay. That's how I, that's how I kept in touch with my parents. For, for many of you, it's, you know, you sit in your room, you're lying on your back, you're texting, you're Skyping, FaceTiming. Do, do they call it FaceTiming? Because I've never had an, uh, an Apple phone. Right? FaceTiming, all right, just making sure, because I don't want to be like the other sheikh that said, uh, you know, he wanted to say, I'll tweet you, and then he said, I will, I forget, you know, I forget what he said, but it was embarrassing, I mean, even for me, I was like, oh, that's a mistake. It's like the other sheikh that, you know, he was giving a khutbah, and he was saying that Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, had a very photogenic memory, and no one laughed except me, because I was thinking, MashaAllah, that, that memory must have been really beautiful, you know, took great, great pictures. He meant to say, what? Photographic memory, right? And another sheikh, once he gave a talk, and he said that this, you uh, know, this sheikh, he was a suppository of knowledge. You get it? A suppository of knowledge. He, he meant to say a depository of knowledge. Anyway, let's, uh, let's move on. So organize your time. Make sure that you have specified your time. I'm going to sit after Fajr every morning. I'm going to read the Quran. I am going to do my dhikr. I am going to do this or that. So that you have organized your time. As one of I, my professors used to say, Barakatul waqt fi tanzimihi. If you want to have blessings in your time, then you have to organize it. You have to make sure that it's organized, that it's scheduled. And you know that as students, that the more organized you are in your time, the more productive you become. And so of course the month of Ramadan is more deserving of this kind of productivity and organization of time and scheduling than any other time of the month. So this is the, the fourth issue. Number five, something where we fall short in and we don't pay enough attention to. And that is that we don't learn about the virtues and the merits of Ramadan. We don't learn about the fiqh of Ramadan and fasting. And the only time we really pay attention to this is if something happens in the month and we're not sure. For instance, someone calls me and he says, you know, Sheikh, I accidentally drank some water. What's the ruling on my fasting? You know, I, it was the first day of Ramadan. This happens a lot, right? It's the first day of Ramadan. You're fasting, but you're not accustomed to it. It's been a while. And then you start drinking. Like, oh no, someone tells you, you know, or something happens and you're reminded. So is your fasting still valid? Is it? Yes. You sure? Yes. Well, the only way you can be absolutely sure, because I saw some people were not so sure, the only way you can be absolutely sure is if you have knowledge, if you are studying. And perhaps the best book that I can recommend on this topic, if you really want to get the most out of this, is a book called Provisions of the Year After 
by Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah. It's available in one volume, it's the abridged version, published by Darus Salam. It's called Provisions of the Year After, and it describes the guidance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Ramadan and in fasting. How would we know what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to do? How would we know what's right and what's wrong in the month? If you want to get the most out of something, you need to know as much as you can about that. How many of you studied this university before you came here? Did you just come? Like, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. okay, tailors, halas, right? And then maybe if you just, you know, maybe if you, if you had just missed your finger a bit, you would have gone to SEGI or UIA or one of the other universities. No, you planned. You asked, maybe you had friends and family that came to this university. You asked how much it's going to cost to study here. You wanted to know how, you know how long it would take. You wanted to know where you would stay. You wanted to know how much it was going to cost you on a monthly basis. What's the price of the ticket? How do I get the visa? Is it going to be an easy, you know, uh, easy process or not? Isn't it so? So if the month of Ramadan is important to you, like your studying was important to you and is important to you, then you will make the time to learn as much about it as you possibly can. There's no doubt in my mind that if we truly recognized how important this month is, we would leave no stone unturned learning as much about it as we possibly could. Now let's move on to the last of my questions. We discussed the virtues and the importance of the month of Ramadan. We spoke about how we can begin to prepare and get our affairs in order before the month begins. Let's talk about ourselves in the month of Ramadan. It's beautiful. We wake up in the morning and I always find this amazing. Every other time of the year, it is super difficult to get people awake for Fajr. Isn't it so? You're like, uh, come on, come on, it's time for Salah. And then people are like, no, I don't want to get up, wake me up later. But when you tell them, come, it's time for Suhoor, they jump out of bed. They run to the kitchen and, you know, some people, are, they, they prepare so much that the night before everything is already laid out. Isn't it so? They got their cereals and their milks and their this and their that, their jams and their cheeses. Everything is ready. So that's amazing. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he tells us, تَسَحَّرُوا فَإِنَّ فِي السُّحُورِ baraka. Have suhoor because in it there is blessings. You all know the difference between fasting without having suhoor and fasting when you've had suhoor. There's a major difference between the two. So we do that. And later in the day, when the time for iftar comes, you find that the people are absolutely, they are absolutely happy. You know, there's this very funny Nando's advert that used to play in Cape Town or in South Africa. And it's a, it's a, it's a video of a guy, he's sitting and he's got the chicken in his hand and his mouth is like, you know, he's just sitting like that. And then you're thinking, what is this, what is this ad about? Like, why is this guy sitting? And then the, the, you know, the camera turns and it's facing the horizon and the sun's about to set. So, and then they say, Happy Ramadan Muslims, you know, Muslims of South Africa or something similar. So, you, you and I are like that. We make so much effort to have suhoor, to make sure that iftar is ready. Look at the amount of effort that goes into the foods that are prepared. Now, you know what we need to think about? Is how can I take that, si that same motivation, that same effort, that same willingness, and how can I channel, ch channel it into something that is going to be even more beneficial than that? That eagerness that you have, just think about this. Suhoor, you are doing it because it's the sunnah. Iftar, with a date, if not with a date, then with water, you are doing it because it's the sunnah, it's the practice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. You are doing these things, not because I told you to do them, or because your parents told you to do them. You are doing them is because this is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam taught. So this is something that I want us to feel in the month of Ramadan, that what we are doing is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam to show and to teach us what to do. We have been created for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this month of Ramadan is one of those many forms of worship. And we do them and we do it the way that we do it because that is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do it. We now in the month of Ramadan, I want you to think that what you are doing is something beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Listen to this hadith Qudsi. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا افْتَرَدْتُهُ عَلَيْهِ That there is nothing that my slave does which is more beloved to me than that which I have made compulsory upon him or her. 
think about that. In the next few days, you are going to start something which Allah has made compulsory upon you. And I want you to think that while you are doing it, this is what Allah has commanded me. And here I am fulfilling that command. This is something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded me. And the most beloved deeds to Allah are those that He has commanded and made compulsory. And here I am doing them. That one of the most important aspects of Islam is that we obey and follow the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he's the most perfect role model. And here I am in the month of Ramadan following that man that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has chosen and sent for us to follow and to obey and to walk in his footsteps and do as he did and to, you know, live our lives the way that he did. So this is the first of these preparations that we need to do in the month of Ramadan. Preparation. I mean, this is how we need to feel in the month. That what we are doing is something that is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, and this is not difficult because number two is the intention or the niyyah. And that's not something difficult because if you are fasting in the month of Ramadan and you are staying away from eating and drinking, then no one knows that you're doing that. You guys go back to your dorm room and you're alone there. You open up your fridge, mashallah. And you have all this, this amazing things to eat and drink. Open up your little cupboard. You've got these biscuits and you know, you can order pizza. No one will know. Isn't it so? You guys know what I'm talking about. So you have all, you have access to all of this food. But you're in your room alone and you don't eat or drink. Why is that? Why would you not, you know, what's the point of, of fasting? It's in this month where we truly understand that perhaps you might have taqwa. You might be conscious and aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You might know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm, I'm not seeing you, your parents are not seeing you, your spouse is not seeing you. No one sees you. No one knows what you are doing. But in the month of Ramadan, we begin to develop that idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees us. That if I, if, I was, if I was to eat or to drink right now, it would nullify the whole purpose. A few days ago, a couple came to me and said, Sheikh, our son, he is contemplating, thinking about leaving Islam. He's young, he's in his 20s, he's a Malaysian, he grew up as a Muslim, but he, he, be, he believes that he doesn't want to be a Muslim anymore. And he has told his parents that he doesn't want to fast the month of Ramadan. You know, uh, he has decided that he doesn't really believe in Allah. He has decided that, you know, all this... Uh, all this religious, uh, you know, all the stuff, rituals, he doesn't want to do them anymore. And you know what? I admire that. So his parents looked at me like you are looking at me now. And I do this a lot when I talk to, to, to teenage, my teenage students. Because many of them, they come to my classes, they come unwillingly. You know, you know that feeling, right? You, you don't want to go to an Islamic class, but your parents say, you are going or else. So I tell them, listen, if you don't want to be here, then tell me and I will convince your parents not to make you be, not to bring you, not to force you. I, when I started memorizing the Quran, I was 18 years old, all right? And I just started to practice my religion, just starting to pray, you know, just starting to stay away from my old friends. And so when the, the, the school that I went to, there were so many of, of, my, of my, my colleagues, my classmates that were like me. But unlike me, they were still doing the things that I was trying to, to leave behind. So Monday mornings during break, they'll talk about clubbing, they'll talk about the drugs that, that you know, they had over the weekend, the drinking. And remember, these are people doing what? Studying accounting and finance and, you know, and, uh, and no. These were people memorizing Quran. They were memorizing Quran Mondays to Fridays, full-time tahfidh students. But who was still no salah, no fasting in the month of Ramadan, doing everything which Allah had prohibited. What's the point if we are doing it, if we are not doing it for the sake of Allah? What's the point of doing it if it's done only because we don't want people, we don't want our reputation to be spoilt in some way. It only means anything if it is done with ikhlas and sincerity. I'm only doing this because I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I hope for His reward. I want to... I, I want to be able to reach those, those gardens of Jannah. Because otherwise, you should do what I said, you know, to, the, to, to those parents. Let him go. Because ultimately, as a father, 
That will be probably, if that ever happened to me, may Allah protect me and you. But if that ever happened to me, it will be probably the most painful thing that could ever happen. But my son or my daughter, they are responsible for themselves in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِي on the day of judgment, a man will flee from his brother. Wa ummihi wa abi, and his father and his mother. Wa sahibatihi wa bani, and his wife and his children. Everyone will have only their own fear, own affair that they will be dealing with on that day. You will run away from your own family members, your own children on the day of Qiyamah, because they are responsible for themselves. So to come back to the issue of ikhlas, there's just two things I want to mention in relation to that. The hadith Qudsi, where the Prophet says that Allah said that all of the actions of the son of Adam, all of our actions, right, are for us, except fasting, because that's for me.